Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming, and uh, welcome to our first Dessert with a Doc program. I understand that uh, the plans are to have this at least once a month, and so I think maybe I'm the guinea pig here tonight, uh, <coughs> just getting things started. But I also would like to uh, send out a welcome to our internet watchers who are watching from their computers at home. Welcome to you, and um, I hope that our program is informative as well as maybe a little entertaining. My name is David Dubois, and I'm an anesthesiologist who works here at Ukiah Valley Medical Center, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about anesthesia. But before I start, there's some people I would like to thank. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the dessert. Uh, this is a, a vegan chocolate mousse, and it's put together by Jim Stewart, our chef here. And uh, by the way, he is a great cook, a great chef. And I just want to thank the hospital food service staff for, for making our refreshments possible. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Nick Bejarano. He's our marketing manager and Kirk Fuller, the guy behind the box here, and cameras, who helped me put this together. So I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm one of five physician anesthesiologists here at the hospital, and I'm prejudiced, but I think we have a pretty good team here. Um, we've all been in practice for more than 20 years, and some of us a lot longer than that. It's disturbing to me that next month, I will have been here 35 years. My, how time flies. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's get started here tonight. Um, so our topic tonight uh, is, is anesthesia, and some would say that anesthesia people suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder. and. Since I mentioned that I've been here for almost 35 years, uh, I'll just describe a little bit how bad I have the disease. When I came here in 1978, I started keeping a log, and I wrote down all the cases, and I began to number them. And so I have a continuous number, and when I finish this afternoon in the operating room, this is how many cases I've, I've done since I've been here. So I've been around the block a, a few times. I figure I've done at least everybody in the valley once, maybe twice, some maybe three times. <laughs> so I want to find out a little bit about you. How many here in the audience have never had surgery or anesthesia before? Oh, we got a couple. A couple. Okay. <clears throat> Well, you know, from time to time, uh, a patient will tell me, they'll say, you know, the surgery doesn't bother me much, but the anesthesia really scares me. So I hope what we share with you tonight, if you're one of those, that um, it will ease your anxiety about anesthesia. So what is an anesthesiologist? Um, we are physicians who practice anesthesia, and we, we really are in charge of your perioperative care. Uh, so we take care of you before anesthesia, during surgery and anesthesia, and afterwards. Uh, we, we go to college, and then we take, have four years of medical school. We have one year of internship, followed by a residency, which is three years. And then some pursue a fellowship year as well. There are fellowships in <clears throat> a number of subspecialties, such as cardiovascular anesthesia, um, OB anesthesia, pediatric anesthesia. You can become fellowship trained in pain, and as well as uh, OB anesthesia. So most of us are about 30 years old before we start working, for ourselves anyway. So let's define what anesthesia is. Anesthesia is a total or partial loss of sensation to touch or pain induced intentionally by the administration of anesthetic drugs to provide medical treatment. Did you know there are three natural anesthetic states? These occur naturally. 
Anybody have any idea what they might be? What did you say? There you go. How about another one? Well, that's, that's close. Huh? <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you're, you're close. The word I had was fainting. <coughs> and there's one more. This is one we don't like to talk about much. Yeah. <coughs> so I want to discuss with you a little bit the types of anesthesia. And um, there are several. So there's general, there's local, oh yes, and there's lectures. Um, I just want to say that all in my encounters with the public every day, people invariably fall asleep. And so if that happens tonight here, I'm going to feel really bad. So <laughs> I'm going to try to keep your interest, OK? So back to, let's talk about general anesthesia. Not that guy. So general anesthesia is where we use IV medication and inhalational uh, gases to basically render you unconscious uh, so that you can have a, a surgical procedure. And I'm going to have a lot more to say about this. Uh, I just want to cover the types of anesthesia. Then, then we have regional anesthesia. Um, and there's several types, categories in there. This, what you're looking at there is a spinal anesthetic. It's where we inject um, uh, local anesthesia into the spine, either spinal or epidural. Um, we do a lot of spinals for C-sections and epidurals for ladies that are laboring. And then there's um, various nerve blocks that we do where we render an extremity insensitive to pain. And it also, we use them for uh, pain control after surgery. Then there's local anesthesia. You can see here the surgeon is injecting the anesthesia in the hand and then he does a carpal tunnel release uh, while the patient's awake and sometimes observing. Uh, with, with local anesthesia, Sometimes we are called in to help monitor the patient and give sedation. So we're involved in some of that. So before you come to the operating room, there is a pre-anesthesia period. And uh, several things happen there. Uh, your doctor will visit with you. He'll take a, a brief medical history when he'll ask you about previous anesthetic um, experiences you've had, whether you've had any problems. He'll do a brief physical exam, such as listen to your heart and lungs. He'll review your laboratory data. Then he'll create and discuss an anesthetic plan. And then he'll order pre-anesthetic med medications if, if they're needed. So when you go under, what happens? We're going to talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> General anesthesia has five major effects on your body. And these are constantly being researched uh, to develop new techniques, new drugs um, to target each one of these characteristics. So number one, anesthesia uh, provides a lack of consciousness. And that, that's good. We want you to not be aware of your surroundings and what's going on during surgery. So it, it also provides analgesia, which is a, the ability to block uh, your ability to feel any pain. It provides amnesia, prevents you from the formation of any memories so that you don't remember anything about uh, being in the operating room. Um, many people who have preoperative medication don't even remember being wheeled down the hall into the operating room. Some of the medication we give uh, helps to relax your muscles and keeps you still during surgery. This is important for a couple of reasons. Um, it helps us when we are establishing a, a, a safe and good airway. It also gives good muscle relaxation during surgery because the surgeon needs your muscles to be relaxed because uh, you may not be aware of this, but your body still reacts to painful stimuli even though you're asleep and not aware of it. So your muscles will tighten up and it can interfere with surgical exposure during the, during the surgery. So as you might imagine, if you were awake and could feel um, 
some of your surgery, your heart rate would go up, your blood pressure would go up, your breathing would increase. And so anesthesia helps to stabilize those body functions and, and we like to keep things as normal as possible in the operating room. So general anesthesia has three main stages. The induction phase, which is just going under, and the maintenance phase, that's keeping you under. And the, re the emergence phase, which is your recovery period where you're actually waking up. And um, <clears throat> there's always work continually going on to find new ways to make it safer and more effective. In 35 years, a lot of the medications and some of the tools that we use and everything has changed a lot since, since I was trained. So what I'd like to do now is actually, via video, take you into the operating room and show you that environment, show you um, the anesthesia machine, show you a little bit about the tools that we use and the medications that we give so that you have some idea of, of what happens in the operating room. So we'll go to the video. opportunity today to talk to you a little bit about general anesthesia and to give a short demonstration of how we give general anesthesia that is commonly done in the United States every day. I want to show you a little bit about the anesthesia machine, some of the IV medications that we use, some of the tools that we have which help us to induce and maintain general anesthesia. Uh, the anesthesia that we use today is one that's commonly used for, let's say, a hernia repair or if you need your gallbladder removed or maybe a hysterectomy or even a knee arthroscopy. On the day of your surgery, uh, you will come to the hospital and go through the admitting office where you will fill out your paperwork and then be directed to what's called the ready room um, at our hospital. In there you'll be greeted by the nurses who will begin to actually begin the process of getting you ready for surgery. This will include um, putting you in a hospital gown and doing a brief history and physical exam. They will take your vital signs. Uh, they will talk to you about what medications you're on and they will start an intravenous in either your hand or your arm and then they will also give you some any preoperative medications that may have been ordered. So essentially getting you ready to come to the operating room. In the operating room we will begin the process of uh, placing the monitors on the patient so that we can monitor them uh, throughout the anesthesia. The first thing that we will use is a called a pulse oximeter and it goes on your finger just like this. What this does is gives us a continuous a number readout of the percentage of oxygen in the patient's blood. Then we will place the cardiac monitor. Uh, these little pads uh, go on the patient's chest and that um, shows up on our screen as a heart rate and as a heart rhythm. The next thing we would do is put the blood pressure cuff on, on the arm and that would give us a readout of the blood pressure every two to three minutes. Following this, we would <clears throat> put this mask um, on the patients, over the patient's nose and mouth. The reason we do this is uh, because as a patient is breathing room air, uh, they get some oxygen, but it's uh, room air is full of nitrogen and we want to flush that nitrogen out of the system and give them fresh 100 percent oxygen. So the patient is then uh, breathing oxygen and we will begin to administer the IV medications. So let's talk a little bit about um, the IV medications. Right here um, we have Versed which is a benzodiazepine and many times that is given in the pre-op area as a preoperative relaxer or an anti-anxiety agent. And so the patient may have already gotten that 
and uh, when they come to the operating room they're nice and relaxed and calm. The next thing we would give uh, typically would be, uh, it's called fentanyl, it's a narcotic which helps to reduce uh, painful stimuli in the operating room as well as carry over into the uh, recovery area. The next agent that we would use is a white liquid material, it's called propofol. That is the major um, induction agent and that um, <clears throat> is of, of the hypnotic kind that uh, will induce the unconscious state and um, uh, make the patient uh, fall asleep and, and uh, not be aware of any of their surroundings. Uh, this is succinylcholine and rocuronium which are muscle relaxants or paralytics. They relax the muscles and allow us to place an airway in the patient and also um, obtain a real relaxed uh, surgical um, exposure for the surgeon to accomplish the operation. Once we've given the uh, IV medications uh, then we need to is assist you with your breathing and we have some tools uh, which will help to establish a good safe airway during your anesthetic experience. Uh, the first one that's commonly used is called a laryngeal mask airway or LMA. This is a breathing tube that just goes down uh, behind the tongue, down into the back of your throat and is lodged right at the opening of your esophagus and allows uh, the anesthetic gases and the oxygen to ventilate the lungs um, quite easily. So this is a commonly used airway. Another airway is this one which is called an endotracheal tube. Uh, this tube also goes down uh, behind the tongue and into the back of your throat and is, is <clears throat> the insertion of it is facilitated by what's called a laryngoscope. So we would take our laryngoscope and open the patient's mouth and place this behind the tongue and gently slide it down into the back of the throat and then we would lift up the tongue and expose uh, the vocal cords and the trachea. Then while we're looking under direct vision we would slide the endotracheal tube through the back of the throat and in between the vocal cords and into the trachea. Then we remove the laryngoscope and we've established a good safe airway for the remainder of your anesthetic. Once we have the airway established then uh, we turn on the anesthesia gases and we can uh, place you on a ventilator. Uh, as you can see here uh, the machine now is assisting your respirations and we can maintain this uh, throughout the anesthetic experience. Anesthesia is composed of a, th of a three part process. There is the induction phase in which we render a patient unconscious and then there is the maintenance phase where we maintain that unconscious state um, until the surgery is finished and then we have the emergent phase or what we would call waking you up after the surgery is finished. So at this point we are in the maintenance phase and during your anesthesia what we do then is to usually sit at the head of the table and during the operation we are observing the operation, um, we are observing the patient and then we are observing our monitors um, and making adjustments um, depending on the events of surgery and um, what's happening on the operating table. Uh, we have the ability to uh, maintain anesthesia by um, adjusting the flows of our gases and we can also give more medications, uh, more muscle relaxant, uh, more narcotics or whatever uh, you might need during the anesthesia. The gases are come from the machine and they flow into the circuit uh, which through these tubes <clears throat> in and down through the airway and into the patient's lungs. From there in the lungs the bloodstream picks up the anesthesia gases and delivers them to the tissues 
and uh, thereby maintaining the unconscious state. Uh, the waste gases and carbon dioxide that, that a patient would blow off then come back through the circuit on the other side. They're delivered uh, back into the machine. The CO2 is absorbed on a CO2, uh, the CO2 pellets and the, the anesthetic gases are then mixed in with fresh gases which are again delivered to the patient. Uh, we're also um, on a chart. We're charting your vital signs and uh, the medications that we use and any events that might happen during surgery. So there is a permanent record of the anesthetic experience. So the last phase of the anesthesia is what we call the emergent phase and that is basically the phase in which we would wake you up. So uh, as we're observing the surgeon and we see that he's about to finish the operation, then what we would do is we would begin to taper off the anesthetic gases. We would adjust them and turn them down a little bit so that you would uh, enter a lighter state of anesthesia in preparation for waking up. Once the operation is finished and the bandages are being put on, then we would turn off our anesthetic gases and give you 100% oxygen. Also at this time we are going to assess um, the level of anesthesia that uh, you have and at that point we may be giving some reversal agents which would uh, reverse the muscle relaxants that we had given previously. It also might reverse some of the narcotics if that's needed and we would uh, begin to uh, lighten you up so that in a few minutes you would actually wake up. At a certain point um, when you begin to breathe on your own and uh, no longer need assistance with your breathing, then we would uh, remove the endotracheal tube. Usually in two to three minutes uh, you will be ready to be transferred from the operating table back onto the gurney and taken to the recovery room. In the recovery room, you will be met by the recovery room nurse who will uh, place the monitors back on. Uh, she will uh, take your vital signs and uh, begin the process of uh, the recovery period. Uh, during your recovery period you will be given medications for pain, uh, for nausea if you should need it, uh, for anxiety if, if that's needed. And usually the recovery room period lasts anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours depending on the severity of your um, operation or any, of, any other medical issues that might be present. The anesthesia team at Ukiah Valley Medical Center is composed of five physician anesthesiologists and um, if you should ever need our services in the future I just want to reassure you that we'll take excellent care of you. Thanks for watching. Okay, here we go. So, um, just a little, little general things about um, anesthesia I, I want to cover here. Uh, number of surgeries done in the United States, 40 million. There's 35 to 45,000 operating rooms in the United States. Every day, 60,000 people have surgery in the U.S. So if you need surgery on any given day, you can have lots of company. There's uh, <clears throat> 42,000 anesthesiologists and 44,000 nurse anesthetists. As you can imagine, uh, there's, with all those operating rooms, there's not enough anesthesiologists to go around. So uh, nurse anesthetists also um, man a lot of the operating rooms. So <clears throat> I want to talk just briefly about the history of anesthesia. Um, as you can see, it was organized as a, as a specialty in 1940. If you were born in 1800 and you needed surgery, you were in trouble uh, because there was no anesthesia and really because there was no anesthesia, there wasn't much surgery either. So as a matter of fact, our second president of the United States, John Adams, he had a daughter named Abigail and, and she was about 40 years old. She 
was diagnosed with breast cancer. Back then, what they did was they would give you opium or alcohol until you just about passed out. They would put a stick in your mouth and tell you to bite down on it. Then there would be several strong men who would hold you down and they would do the surgery. Horrible, brutal. So um, <clears throat> things got a little better um, as, as time went on. Uh, but it wasn't until about 1844 that they, that, uh, they discovered that nitrous oxide uh, worked um, to, it was actually in, the, in a dentist who discovered it, that he could pull a tooth pain-free using nitrous oxide. And a few years later, um, ether was demonstrated to be um, useful for anesthesia, but really it didn't start coming together until 1880 when ether and nitrous oxide were used together. And even though anesthesia was primitive, it, it was still worked, but the uh, death rate was way too high. So, um, <coughs> speaking of that, um, in 1950, there was a large study where they looked at deaths from anesthesia trying to assess the risk. And even in 1950, one person out of every 1,500 died from anesthesia-related deaths. So as you can see, in the last 20 years, anesthesia deaths have dropped dramatically from one in 10,000 to one in 400,000 now. So, and that's due to much better drugs, much better techniques, much better monitors, and better training. So we're making progress. I want to talk a little bit about anesthesia side effects. Uh, sore throat is, is uh, one that's fairly common. Uh, as you can imagine, we are, as anesthesiologists, are concerned about airways and we want to establish a good airway in everybody and so we use some sort of device to establish that airway. And so we're manipulating in your throat and in your mouth. So, so we are trying to be very gentle and careful, but it, is, um, it does happen and we make every effort to try to minimize any sore throat that you might have from anesthesia. Next is, this stands for post-operative nausea and vomiting. That's a common unfortunate side effect. And there are some risk factors that would increase that um, in a particular case. If you're young and if you're female, if you have a history of motion sickness or if you've had previous nausea and vomiting, then your risk of that goes up. Also, if you're a non-smoker, it's about the only thing I've ever found <laughs> that w is positive about smoking. Um, but I don't recommend taking it up for that. So sometimes longer surgeries, you'll have a little more nausea if you, certain surgical types like laparoscopy, um, surgery on the on, uh, ear, nose, and throat, or eye surgery, some of those have a little bit more uh, chance of, of, of nausea. Uh, there's some anesthesia-related factors if we have to use more narcotic than usual or, or a little more inhalational anesthesia, sometimes that's unavoidable. But the good news is we have medications and it's fairly routine, it's our routine that we put anti-nausea or anti-emetic drugs in your IV before you wake up. So it's not all, it doesn't always work, but it certainly does help a lot. So we try, we have tricks and different things that we can do to minimize this side effect. Post-anesthesia confusion and cognition. Now, everybody, when they wake up from anesthesia, they go through a brief period of what I would call confusion and a little bit of disorientation. You're not quite sure where you are or what's going on. Usually only lasts for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then you're fine. And, but there is, there is some prolonged um, problems that happen occasionally what they call an emergence delirium, where some patients will just be really out of it and disoriented and uh, trying to get out of bed, and, and this can sometimes last for 30 minutes to an hour. Usually we, we can uh, talk you through it, reassure you, tell you, 
you're doing fine, your surgery's over, we're giving you pain medication, and we can give medication that will help that too. There's one other um, neurologic thing that's called postoperative cognitive decline, and that happens, unfortunately, in the uh, very elderly and people who have a lot of medical issues. Now, those patients are ones that we try to give as little anesthesia as we can get by with because um, they can enter a period of, of neurologic decline that can last for several days and it just takes them a long time to, to regain their orientation and, and um, get back to where they normally were before. There's a lot of research going on about that to try to find new medications and new, new drugs uh, that will help with that. This also has to do with uh, the airway manipulation. We ask about loose teeth and, and we're careful to try not to hurt your lips or knock your teeth out. Uh, there's reactions to medications and anesthetics. Unfortunately, sometimes there's a, an allergic reaction to a medication that we give, such as a rash might develop or something of that nature. Um, we can treat that with medications. The, the, the more um, critical reactions can be an anaphylactic reaction, which can be life-threatening, <clears throat> but we're always watching for that, and we have, again, medications uh, where we can usually handle that. Then there's end organ effects. Anesthesia affects all of, all of your major organs, such as your brain, your heart, your lungs, your liver, your kidneys. And so when we do our pre-anesthetic assessment, we're always asking about any heart problems, lung problems, any problems with your liver or kidneys and so forth. There may be times when we might order special tests. We also might use special monitoring devices during the anesthetic so that we um, can zero in on that particular organ. So as you might imagine, uh, after practicing for 35 years, and when I talk to patients about anesthesia, I pretty much heard it all. But um, I want to just cover three or four of the more common things that patients will tell me about anesthesia when, when, I, when I interview them. So here's one that's very common. A patient will tell me, well, I get sick after every anesthetic. So we kind of covered this in our post-op nausea and vomiting. I, I reassured them that we're going to give them drugs. We're going to use an anesthetic technique that hopefully will minimize that. And so we are, we are doing our best to minimize them being sick. Here's one I hear too often. My heart stopped during anesthesia. <laughs> and this is a weird one. Um, most of the time, I don't know what's going on. I'll have to be honest with you, um, because I don't see this happen, uh, but a lot of patients will tell me that. And so I usually don't have an old anesthetic record, um, and so I really don't know exactly what they're talking about. I want to reassure you, though, that, that when a patient says that, we're very careful to, to assess their heart and to... Um, do studies, we'll look at their EKG, we'll listen to their heart and lungs, we'll order some special studies if we need to. We might even need a cardiology consult and so forth. So we're, we're tuned in to listening to anything that the patient might say. So here's a disturbing one. It says, I woke up during the anesthetic. And I want to talk to you about that a little bit more on our next slide. Uh, so let's just skip that one for now. We'll go to the next, next slide. There's one more that's an interesting one. You aren't going to give me that stuff they gave Michael Jackson, are you? <laughs> Michael Jackson died in August of 2009. And before that, nobody had heard of propofol. Nobody knew about it. Now every, it seems like everybody knows about it. So I get this um, every now and then. <clears throat> so my answer to this question is, yes, I am. Absolutely, I'm going to give it to you. But the difference is that I'm going to be right there, and I'm going to monitor you, and I'm going to make sure you're breathing, and make sure that you do well with it. So that usually, that usually helps. So I want to talk to you a little bit about anesthesia awareness. Uh, this is uh, a complicated and uh, rather controversial topic. 
The picture you're looking at there is from the 2007 movie called Awake. I don't know if any of you have seen it. I have not seen it. But anesthesia awareness is a real thing and it's uh, very disturbing to people who work in anesthesia. And I, and I really question, it says one per 1,000 there, and I don't know if that's correct, although you'll see it if you look it up on the internet or look, look in anesthesia literature. I think there's several things going on here, and I want to just, just tell you about that a little bit. Uh, some people, I think, are a little bit confused about what their anesthesia is supposed to do and going to do. By that I mean if you come and you're going to have, let's say, a colonoscopy or an upper endoscopy and we tell you, now we're going to just give you sedation so that you're um, sort of halfway in la-la land, uh, you might be aware of some things that are going on, but we'll be right there, we'll give you more medication. So there may be a brief period of awareness. Those people may be confusing that they woke up during anesthesia when really we're, we're not surprised. We're, we're not putting them totally asleep. So that could, that could explain some of this. Also, people are confused as, as they wake up in the recovery room. They're not sure where they are. Why am I awake? How come the operation hasn't started? I hear that all the time. Um, is my surgery over? I, I, you know, they, they, because it's such a quick time between when they go to sleep and when they wake up. So that may explain some of this too. But there is a real um, problem with anesthesia awareness where a patient will have paralyzing medication on board and not have enough anesthesia so that they are awake and, and they are aware of surgery, they have pain and it's a horrible thing. So I just want to reassure you that we are very aware of this problem. <laughs> and we take, we have monitors that, that actually measure brain waves so that we can monitor and give us an indication about any problem like this. Uh, we're very tuned into this um, anesthesia awareness and we take very, a um, lot of steps to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, you, you, I need to say here that there are certain surgical situations where anesthesia awareness is, is the risk is higher and that would be in some critical, critical trauma patients, uh, an, an obstetrical emergency, the patient has to have a C-section right now, um, sometimes in heart surgery when patients come off the heart-lung machine. Uh, they, we don't want a lot of anesthesia on board. We want thing. We want the heart to beat and and the patient to you know get started, jump start them. So there are situations where the risk of being aware is is uh, more prominent. So the good news is, is and and I just want to reassure you again that that anesthesia personnel are 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 very tuned into this and. I must tell you, the numbers here say one in 1,000. I will tell you, in all honesty, that of all my almost 34,000 cases, I've only, I know of one time, for me, one time. And that was from an error that we didn't pick up, the anesthesia machine was malfunctioning. So, um, anyway, don't, don't, don't lose any sleep over this tonight, okay? So when your anesthesia and surgery is over, you'll be taken by a bed to the post-anesthesia care unit. They'll put the monitors back on, your, they'll uh, check your vital signs, we'll stabilize them, we'll give you pain medications, and we'll treat any other medical condition that you have. So I'm asked frequently, <clears throat> they'll say, isn't your job really boring? You sit there all day long, you do the same thing. You give patients medications, they go to sleep, you watch them, you sit there for sometimes for hours, and then you wake them up. It's just like, you know, isn't it awfully boring? And I must say that there is some truth to that, but, but I usually find that there are certain things that I need to do, there are certain issues, there's always seemed to be some challenge. 
but going around in anesthesia circles, there is this statement which has some truth to it, and it was told me, I think, in like my first week of anesthesia residency, and here it is. Anesthesia is 99% sheer boredom and 1% sheer terror. So I want to tell you that we like boredom. We really like boredom. We don't like that terror. So other, one other point I want to cover is that some people would say that people that go into anesthesia are of the personality type that's kind of quiet, reserved, and not much personality, no sense of humor. But I, I just want to say that that's not always true. And well, here, I'll give you an example. Patients going down, doobie doo, down, down. Patients going down, doobie doo, down, down. Patients going down, doobie doo, down, down. Waking up is hard to do. Those are nurse anesthetists. They, they call themselves the laryngospasms. And they, um, they have a bunch of songs. You can, look, you can, uh, you can Google them on, on YouTube, and, and they're great. So we have anesthesia back up here. Just in case one of us is sick, the guy with the big mallet, he's pretty effective. Fortunately, we don't have to use him very often. So I want to close here uh, tonight with a little quiz, find out how sharp you are. Um, and this is a one-question quiz. And the first one to uh, get this right, get the, give the answer, just shout it out, OK? So here's my car. I want to focus in on my license plate. Whoa. Go to the head of the class. <laughs> That's really fast. I sedate him. Yeah. So um, I want to take any questions that you might have. Um, I'm finished, but I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that you might have about anesthesia or surgery or the operating room or anything. Sure, yes. Actually, say that again. What could happen if a person did breathe in some of the nitrogen that you say is in the air? Oh. Maybe oh. trying to avoid? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the purpose for the pre oxygenation that we do is really just to, just to you know, when, when you breathe oxygen in room air, it's 
21%. So then, you know, you're breathing any other gases or whatever, and there's uh, nitrogen in there all the time. So we're really just trying to flush that out, and we want to give you 100% oxygen because there's usually a few seconds to a minute or, or well, depending on the airway. When you're really not breathing, we're, we're putting the airway in. So we just want 100% oxygen in there to keep your oxygen saturation and your level up. So that's the purpose. It's not that the nitrogen is dangerous. It's just that we want to kind of give you a boost of oxygen before, before we put you to sleep, or as we're putting you to sleep. Yeah. Yeah, you. Uh, I was curious, uh, at what point does the person that's inter interested in, in a career in medicine decide, well, I want to be an anesthesiologist versus any of the other medical practices that are out there? Yeah, good question. I'll tell you my experience. You know, I, I, I wanted to be a doctor, and, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And uh, in fact, I was gonna, thinking about family practice. And as I went through, the um, <clears throat> first two years are pretty much all book work. And then after that, uh, you start to go through your various rotations. And it's usually a two or three week rotation or whatever. And so on my junior year and even into my senior year, I'd gone through all these rotations, you know, surgery and orthopedics and all the medical specialties and everything. And I was thinking, whoa, I'm not sure I like any of it. Uh, but then I had, but then I went into anesthesia. I had like two weeks of anesthesia and I just enjoyed the operating room. I enjoyed the people. I enjoyed the environment. I like working with my hands. So it's, it's kind of, some people know right off the bat and some it's a process of sort of eliminating. So I didn't find out about anesthesia and that I really liked it until I was halfway through my senior year of medical school. So everybody's different. Some people take part of a residency and find out they can't stand it and they switch. In fact, some people um, one, of, one of my colleagues here, I think she, she went into pediatrics and then switched to anesthesia. And another one was the internal medicine then switched to anesthesia. So there's some switching going on even after you finish sometimes. So, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, you had your hand up next. Um, my question is, because having an allergic reaction can be so serious, yeah. um, is there any way that I've had allergic like, colonoscopies mm -hmm. and I have no idea what the drugs are. No, I mean, you can if you like, but you don't really need to. That's, that's not necessary. What, what we usually ask is, is we'll ask a patient, have you had any trouble with anesthesia or are you allergic to any medications? Now, if you've had trouble with anesthesia, usually you will know about it. Yes, absolutely, yeah. If I have trouble with anybody with a difficult airway or any kind of problem with any drug or whatever, I make sure in the recovery room or before they go home, I sit down and say, this is what you need to know about the anesthetic experience you had, and this is what you need to tell any other anesthesia providers in the future. So they would tell you, yeah. Yes? Yes, I wanted to know, after you get out of recovery, yeah. uh, how long does it take for your body to overcome the effects of the anesthesia? And if you had repeated ones like every year or whatever, yeah. do those accumulate? And as we get older, are the effects any different? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to remember those. Um, <clears throat> how long does it take the anesthesia to kind of wear off is what you're asking. Um, Again, everybody is different in that, and, and it depends on, on your surgery and how long your anesthetic was, basically. So, but to try to answer that, uh, usually, I mean, there's be trace amounts of anesthesia in your body for 24 hours, sometimes more, but uh, usually enough of it has, has gone out. So that if you have an outpatient procedure, most of the time you can go home within an hour or two after recovery. That's kind of an average. So you, and, and then you were, let's see, you were asking about? Well, it, it, you have repeated. Uh, oh yes, repeated. Every, every yeah, no, it doesn't every accumulate. Every it does not accumulate. We have pe people who will be in the hospital and they need an anesthetic every day, sometimes for three or four days in a row. So, and that's not a problem. 
I mean, it's, you know, you don't, we don't give anesthesia for fun or it's not really good for you. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that, that multiple anesthetics in one hospital stay or if you need, a, need an anesthetic on consecutive days, it's not, it's not a problem. You'll, you'll do fine. The other thing you were asking about age, as we aged, is it different? Yes, it is. Yes, we're more sensitive most of the time. Uh, you know, your, your body sort of wears out as you age, and so you're, you're not as vigorous and your organs aren't as strong and young as they were when you're young. So usually with younger people, I have to give more anesthesia. With an older person, I give less. I mean, that's a general rule. So. One more question. Yeah. I, I have an outpatient uh, operation every, every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there going to come a time when I'm too old to have an anesthetic? No. Not really. Um, last month, I did a lady for a fractured hip. She was 103, and she did well. You know, as you as you reach, you know, really get aged, um, we give much less anesthesia. You know, and we're careful. I mean, we're always careful, but but maybe some more monitoring devices, and we just try to limit the anesthesia to as little as we can get by with and still keep you comfortable and asleep. So. You reminded me of one more question. Yeah. I'm hearing all the time, and one was only just in the last month or so, people that die on the operating table. Yeah. Is that from anesthesia, or is it something else, or is it varied? Or? Right. It, <coughs> it's, it's, it varies. I mean, certainly there are, there are uh, people who, who die on the operating table. Yes, it, it happens. And, and there's so many different reasons for that. Uh, sometimes if, if we have a major trauma and they're too, yeah, they're too unstable uh, to be shipped, let's say, to, to a bigger center and we have to operate here. And you know, uh, there are some critical, critical injuries. And as, as, as we age, uh, you get into a situation where either the patient's going to die if you don't do anything, and their best chance of survival is to, is to do an operation. So if, if, you were, if you were 98 years old and you had a ruptured appendix and, and you were septic from that, um, you would die without an operation. And yet, yet we get put in the situation that I have to give you an anesthetic for that. So it's critical, uh, you know, you, you, with, with a sepsis, which is infection all throughout your body, uh, and if you're very aged and have a lot of medical issues, it's pretty scary for us because we don't want people to die on the operating table. But sometimes that's the only hope they have is to have surgery and anesthesia. So, yeah. I don't know who was first. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe it, it's somatic, but it's pure oxygen and 100% oxygen. I understand 100% oxygen is poison. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. You and, and saying pure oxygen, what do you mean? Well, we, when we turn, when the oxygen that comes out of the machine and out of, out of our tanks is 100% is oxygen. So, you know, and, and that is not something like you say that you'd want to give a person for any length of time, any long period of time. But we use it for brief periods. It won't hurt you for, for a brief period just because you're going to have a, a brief period where we're manipulating getting an airway in and you're not breathing at your, you know, six to eight times a minute. So it's a very brief period. So, and it won't hurt you for a short period of time, yeah. So, some other hands. Yes, yes. Uh, can the uh, anesthesia affect your appetite on the final um, Well, briefly it could. I, I, there's not, I don't see anything about that it will affect your appetite for maybe just a few hours. If, if you're feeling the effects of anesthesia and you're still kind of nauseated and sick, sick from anesthesia, uh, it, it's, it's, you're not going to be very hungry. Yeah. But, but long-term appetite, no. I, I don't think so. That's a good question. I haven't really thought about it. And I haven't had people tell me that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. One good thing, I haven't wanted Yeah. Yeah. Well, I must say this. We get blamed. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. We, we get blamed for a lot of stuff that isn't our fault. <laughs> That's my way out of that one. Uh, yeah. You know, that's probably more a surgical complication. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know what kind of surgery you had, but, but anesthesia does not hang around for six months. You know, it, your kidneys and your liver and your lungs, they get rid of it pretty fast. So it's not, yeah. Yeah. So there are other hands. I just wondered with that uh, airway procedure mm -hmm. done on every uh, operation. Yeah. Procedure. Yeah, good question. Uh, it's a very common, but there are f a few short procedures. Now you saw me in there when we put the mask on, ma mask over the patient's nose and mouth. For sometimes really short procedures, I can just do that. I don't need to put anything in your mouth. And if we're doing cases under regional anesthesia, spinal or epidural, we don't do any, put anything in the mouth. Also, uh, local anesthesia where we're, we're just doing sedation, like if you have a colonoscopy, and we're involved, we can give you medications. We don't have to put an airway in. Yeah. So it's not, not always. Yeah. Yes? Waking up and someone says aspiration, what does that mean? Oh, yeah. Good question. Yeah. And we're, we're very concerned about that. Um, <clears throat> aspiration is actually stomach contents, food, gastric juices, whatever, that you would regurgitate up, and then, it would, and then you would take a breath in, and it gets into your lungs serious problem, can be fatal. So, and, and here's where we um, get in difficult situations, because as you can imagine, somebody goes to a restaurant, they have a big meal, and then on the way home they get in a bad car accident, and they need an operation right away. So they got a full stomach. So we have techniques where we, on that airway procedure, where we minimize um, that. To happen. We, we, what's called cricoid pressure, we'll have an assistant, like a nurse, hold some cricoid pressure just to kind of prevent anything to come up. It, it, it closes down the esophagus to help prevent that from happening. And we do what we call rapid sequence induction where we're shooting the drugs in quick and then we get that airway in fast. So, yeah, yes, but that's what aspiration is. Aspiration is um, regurgitating stomach contents back and getting it back into your lungs. So that's why we, that's what those airways are for. To prove. If you if you were to vomit and and with that air with those airways in, it's particularly the endotracheal tube that have that cuff on it that's down in your trachea, you're fine. It w it won't go down in into your lungs. So that's why we have that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be conscious mm -hmm. of what was happening. So I was. <coughs> but after it was over, I had the shakes pretty badly. Mm -hmm. um, but that was 34 years ago. Does they have anything to eliminate that happening again? Yeah, I, I, I see. I don't have to have a baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? For whatever. You were just kind of shaking all over afterwards. Yeah. This was after a spinal for a C section. Yeah. Yeah. I see that still commonly, very common. And what's going on there, it's, it's, a, it, it's kind of a basket of, of, of things going on. First of all, when, when you're in labor or you're, or you're facing a C-section, a cesarean section, uh, y your, your body is pumping out a lot of adrenaline and a lot of hormones and a lot of things going on. Uh, the, the surgery is stressful, whether you maybe didn't feel stressed or, or you might have. Surgery is stressful. The body is stressed because it's being, you know, cut on and even though you're not feeling it. So there's a lot of your, of those chemicals and stuff that's going on. It makes you shake. Sometimes the patients are cold from the operating room. That, that can add to it. But it, there's a lot of things that it's hard to prevent and, and hard to treat. We, we have a, a couple of, some, sometimes a narcotic will help that. Um, but it usually goes away pretty quick. I mean, I stopped, you could tell. Yeah. But it, it, it used to be able to be awesome. Yeah. Thank you for taking it. Yeah, sure. We have time for a few more questions. Okay. We want to make sure to get you out of here on time. 
Okay, yes. Uh, speaking of babies, do you do any epidurals where you can get up and walk around? Or, or do you always have to be? <coughs> yeah, walking epidural, yeah. Um, we, well, we could, I guess. We don't here. I think it's more of a nursing thing. When we, when we do an epidural, usually they con you're confined to bed, to the bed. And um, I, I have to ask some of the nurses in there. We, we, that's the policy here, I believe, is that when you have an epidural, you're, you're in bed. Um, whether you can walk around, it's possible, I, I know, because I, you know, I, I know about it. Um, I'll, you ask me when you see me in the hall, and I'll, I'll, I'll check into it. Yeah, yeah, but I, th I believe the policy here is that once you have an epidural, then you're confined to bed. You can't get up and go to the bathroom. And yeah, yes, falls. Yeah, we don't want you falling when you're, you know, at that, at that stage. Oh, oh, you mean, <laughs> oh, we're pretty quick, pretty fast. We can get here in five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the procedure during an endoscopy? Because you have a tube down your throat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you don't put the breathing tube down also. We can, but, yeah, we can, but we usually don't. Uh, it's possible because they're, you know, different. I mean, you can still have that endotracheal tube down into your trachea and your esophagus. He can put that right past and in the esophagus. So it's, it's not a problem to do it. But uh, you, you might, maybe, from e either one or both. Yeah. So, but you're asking, uh, most of the time, most endoscopies are done without that. We just give you sedation, IV medications, and monitor you. They give you a little oxygen to breathe, and, and you don't need an airway. So you are asleep, but that's where I was talking about the anesthesia awareness. We usually, I usually explain to the patient, now we're going to give you drugs, and you're probably going to sleep through this and not feel anything, but you might, you might be aware just for a few seconds of some voices or something going on, and if you do, it's nothing's wrong, it's just that we'll give you more medication right then. So most of the time, some of the drugs, uh, as, as you saw on there, are, are amnesic in effect. So even if you sort of were even might say something to us, you don't remember. So it's basically the same as far as the anesthesia as a cold. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yes. Now, you, you're, you're asking about the airways? Yeah, so you have to give the patient the medication. Yeah. Right? And then the right kind of gases, right? Yeah. So it has to be both. Yeah. So what is the purpose of the gases when they already give the medication? Oh, so about the gases. Yeah, the gases versus the IV medication. and right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we do. Um, well, you, you don't necessarily have to use both, but we commonly do. Medications, <clears throat> I mean, this gets a little bit of a complicated answer here, and I don't want to make it too complicated, but commonly we give IV medications just to induce sleep. So that, that's the purpose for the IV medications. Now, we could continue to keep you asleep. You know, let's say your operation was two hours long. We could continue to give you those same medications, but it would take a lot of them. And yes, thank you for coming. So. So, when, so the medications are to put you to sleep, and if, if we need to put an airway in there to relax your, relax your throat and your throat muscles and your vocal cords and so that we can put a little tube in. So then usually um, we give the inhalational anesthetic gases to kind of keep you asleep because that way we don't have to continually keep pumping in IV medications, although you can. You can, you can actually have an anesthetic with a propofol drip. You know that white material up there? We can hang a bottle up and just put it on a machine and it drips it in, and we c that can last for hours. So, so we can do both or either, yeah. So I hope that, yeah, yeah. Did that, did that help? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Have they made uh, big strides in this in the 1980s? 
Have they made big strides since the 80s? Yes, and after. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah. I mean, it's changed so much since I came here in 1978. And I look back on that now, and I think, wow, how, how in the world did I even practice? Because we didn't have a lot of this stuff. I, I had to take blood pressures by hand. And, and I, di well, I didn't have a ventilator. I was bagging the patient. I was breathing for the patient with my hand, bagging the patient. And uh, so, you know, it's huge changes, yeah. Yeah, that's why, that's why the insurance rates have gone down and anesthesia safety, as you saw on there, went from one to 10,000 to one to 400,000, you know, so it's, it's uh, And they made great strides too, when they during World War II. Yes. They had all those people that yeah, the box. They did, <laughs> that's right, they did, yeah. So I, I, I just want to be um, tuned into your time, and we've been, uh, if any of you have questions, want to stay and talk to me a little bit more afterwards, I'd be happy to talk to you a little bit more. But thank you all very much for coming. <laughs> I appreciate it. I, I hope this has been helpful. And, and let me just say that I, I, I hope for all of you that, that we meet like this and not in the operating room. <laughs>